And our special guest today is Kathy Bukvar, the Secretary of State, Pennsylvania's top election official. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thanks for having me on, John. Let me ask you the first uh, question. We went through a primary, and as you know, there were some kinks. There were some things that went well. Um, first time mail-in voting. What's the lessons learned? What are some of those lessons learned out of that primary experience? Yeah, great question. Um, well, I'll start out with the background, right? So, um, you know, I pray to God that we never see the confluence of so many challenges, so many different factors you know, be, con, con, being a confluence, experience and confluence in one election. So as you know, over the last two years, every county in the state upgraded to new voting systems with voter verifiable paper trails. 22 counties rolled them out for the first time in the primary of 2020. The rest had already rolled out in 2019. Then of course we had Act 77, historic bipartisan legislation passed at the end of October with more election reforms and changes that we've than we've seen in Pennsylvania in over eight decades. So of course that took effect for the first time for the primary of 2020. Then what nobody saw coming of course was a global pandemic um, that caused a tremendous number of you know restrictions and upheaval. Um, and then fourth, right before election day, we of course had the civil the civil unrest that we saw as a result of um, the police shooting at in, in Minnesota. So the uh, the all the having all those changes converge in one election was a tremendous challenge, particularly for the county election offices. And despite all that, we saw record turnout in Pennsylvania. So if you so Act 77 passed in the fall, one, one of the things it thankfully included was the ability for all Pennsylvanians to vote by mail. And we did that before we saw the pandemic coming, but as it turned out, that was the single most important thing we could have done that enabled access to our democracy to continue unimpeded. So, you know, I think you and I probably talked about this before, you know, the last presidential primary in 2016, a total of 84,000 Pennsylvanians had voted by mail, by absentee ballot in the presidential primary of 2016. In the 2020 presidential primary, nearly 1.5 million Pennsylvanians voted by mail or absentee. And on top of that, over 1.3 million Pennsylvanians came out in person to vote on June 2nd. So we had nearly double the number of turnout uh, in this primary than we had the last time we had an uncontested presidential primary, which was in 2012, both sides of the aisle, no, no contest in the presidential primary, and yet almost 2.9 million Pennsylvanians voted. So let me start out by saying huge kudos to every county in the state for making sure that our voters could vote successfully. Having said that, um, to get to your point, what have we learned? We've learned a lot. Um, we've learned, first of all, that um, going from 84,000 votes by mail to 1.5 million takes a lot of adjustments in county processes, right? Um, and every county um, is very thankful that they were able to provide all that access to the vote, but it's already moved on to what can we do better? So we've been working with them um, from really looking at the process from the moment the very first application is received to the moment the very last ballot is counted and everything in between. So I know that was a long answer, so I'll stop and you could break it down and follow up on each of those, but it's, it's really been a great process already at, at assessing and then figuring out how to make it better. Well, I really don't want to dwell on the past because I do want to move forward with what is going to be new and different uh, for the coming November election. Uh, but I guess the question of the process in terms of getting absentee or mail-in ballot application forms, uh, some counties chose to mail everybody an application form. Allegheny County did just that. Many other counties did not. They left it up to the voter. 
My recollection is that when you and I had this discussion in the spring, uh, right after the election, you thought it would be a good idea to mail everybody in Pennsylvania an application for a mail-in ballot. Where do we stand on that right now? So we are we are in the final stages of assessing that. Um, I think what I said, you know, back when we spoke about this last was, you know, obviously cost is uh, is critical, and this is not something that was budgeted, you know, in our in our state budget. Um, so as you know, we had gotten some federal dollars, and we really have been trying to assess what the most important uses for those federal dollars are. We've also been assessing who who else is sending applications? Because the last thing any of us want is if I receive five applications in the mail and I'm confused and I submit more than one and it doesn't, you know, then the county is dealing with duplicative processing. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons why we wanted to be very thoughtful about this. And I'll tell you, Don, I just received, my household received, um, a mailing of applications from the Bucks County Republican Party. So the parties are sending them out, third party organizations are sending them out, candidates are sending them out because it's for, perfectly legal for anybody to mail applications and it definitely is a well-used strategy. So if I had to guess right now, I think we're leaning towards using those funds for other critical purposes and maybe instead we'll do what we did last election, which was um, mail postcards or some similar mailing to all registered voters, helping them vote on, apply online because our website is so easy to use. It's secure. It's quick. Um, and you don't have to worry about mail for that piece of it. Um, and, and you also eliminate, you know, data entry errors because you're doing it yourself. So, I, not a oh, the, well, the counties, the counties are free. I presume if Allegheny County wants to do in November or in the fall what they did in the spring, send everybody an application, they're free to do it, as are all the 67 counties of Pennsylvania? Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So we have this issue. We had this issue, and you've pointed it out. We're going to have multiple requests to apply for a ballot because the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the county governments, um, special interest organizations, everybody's going to want everyone to vote. So they're going to send, so folks are going to get a lot of these applications in. Right. What prevents people from applying multiple times for multiple ballots? So, and I'll tell you, we are making um, technological changes to our system because what I would like it to do is to block you, if you, to, not in a bad way, but right, if, John Dello already applied and you just forgot, or let's say you click the box in the spring to be a permanent annual voter, but you forgot that you did that um, and you apply, try to apply again now, I would like the system to say, hey, thanks, you're already taken care of, you, no need to do this again, that will save everybody time, save the counties. So that's what we're working on and hopefully that will be in place by November. But even if it weren't, um, the, the system, you can apply, you can apply, for, you can mail in 20 applications. You're only going to get one valid ballot sent to you. Now, I know that there were errors that happened in some, by some mailhouse vendors and others where accidentally more than one application was sent. Only one ballot can be counted for a person. They have specific tailored to that individual codes on the envelope. And so if you try to vote more than one ballot, only one can actually be counted. Well, that's helpful to know. And I think, uh, frankly, the uh, idea of technology blocking multiple applications makes very good sense. Do you think you're going to have that in place by this fall? I do. I very much hope so. And I believe that it will be able to happen. Um, so now the county gets an application from us they have to process it the election officials to send us a ballot when are we allowed to send in an application and when are we likely to get a ballot and how and is it different depending on the county we live in great question so the the it's available now 
you could apply now. The website is back up. The app, online application is back up. So I encourage everybody to go to votespa.com. Very easy. You just check the box that you want to apply for a mail-in or absentee ballot. Walks you through. Very quick, very easy. Um, your eligibility will be checked and so forth before they send you a ballot. What you should know is that, of course, being as it's still July, um, you won't get your ballot until the ballots are finalized, which will be closer to the election. So what you'll get is an email, an automated email that will say, expect to, once you're approved, um, it will say, expect to get your ballot in September or October. Because as you said, it varies some from county to county. So for example, if there's a ballot challenge, um, whether it's a petition challenge or some other reason why a candidate uh, is challenging that they should or shouldn't be, or somebody's trying to drop off of the ballot. Sometimes those take longer um, and they're decided, they may be decided by the local court, they could be decided by a state court. Um, we are encouraging every county in the state to aim for mid September to mail out the first round of ballots. But again, if there's some specific reasons why it's held up by a court challenge, that's a factor that may impact it, but we're encouraging absent a real need to hold it for that reason. We're hoping everybody can get their ballots starting in mid September, 50 days before election day. Yeah, I was gonna say that's about uh, what, six, six weeks before the election. Uh, right, it, yeah, uh, which again, we saw, that was one of the lessons, right? You asked me about the lessons. We saw mail delays, there's no question. I don't want anybody to have to worry about that. I would rather the counties send the ballots out on the early side. You really can't send it too early because then it gives the individuals the ability to mail it back, not worry about it, you know, not have to hold their breath waiting to make sure it's received on time. They'll have that confidence to know that it is. And of course they could go to votespa.com and click on the ballot tracker and they could see the status of both their application and their ballot once, they, once they're once they finalized. Well, you anticipated a question I had, which was about the US Postal Service. As you may know, CBS did a little study uh, where they actually sent out from different locations in New York, they sent out, I believe it was, was it a thousand, either a hundred or a thousand fake ballots to just see how long it took to get back to a central location. 97% of them came back, although it took a week or so, a week to 10 days. They all did not, you know, you don't get overnight delivery, but 3% did not. In a close election, as you know, having you yourself been a candidate once upon a time, 3% in a close election is a huge number of ballots to be lost in the process. Do we have any evidence of lost ballots in the primary? And what can we do about it going forward in the November election? Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, I think um, the reali reality is anytime you have any process, literally across the board, um, there, are there are always opportunities for errors. And unfortunately, that's always going to be the case. And so the key is mitigating, preventing, mitigating, preventing as much as possible. So I think the sending out the ballots earlier is a huge mitigation um, effort to make sure. So if somebody doesn't get their ballot, they have time to follow up. Um, the later in the process you're doing that, the more likely you're going to run out of time. Um, but then there's also quality control processes, of course. So that's one of the things that we're really working on with the counties as well, is making sure that whether they do their, um, their processing in-house or whether they hire a mail vendor, um, you know, this, there were stories I'm sure you were aware of, of errors being made in, in the, you know, the ballot, you know, either the wrong party ballot going out or the wrong address. And again, you, you almost are never in any, in any realm going to have zero error. So the key is reducing it to as close to zero as possible. So I think the combination of, you know, allowing the counties to have enough funding that they can hire the staff that they need, that they can implement the, you know, best practices, the chain of custody, the quality control operations and 
sending it out as early as possible. That combination, every county is working on right now. And if, I guess, of course, if you're really worried about the U.S. Postal Service, you can always hand deliver your ballot. Absolutely. Or, or so you can vote you. in person. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. It's true. So if for people, there were people that I that emailed me, you know, in the days leading up to the election that said I never got my ballot. And, you know, when I, you know, obviously the first plan of action was for them to call the county and find out the status, but if they couldn't, and of course we had, you know, all the office closures, which was an additional challenge, but, you know, I, we believe very strongly at the voting choices in Pennsylvania. So you ha always will have the opportunity. I really at no point wanted to see us go to a, uh, a situation where we were saying everybody had to vote by mail. We wanted to make sure that every person could go in person. And even if you've applied for a ballot by mail, you can still vote by provisional ballot in your polling place on election day. And that will continue. Let me ask you this question, Madam Secretary. Suppose I vote by mail. Uh, I've cast my ballot in mid-September, but then we have three presidential debates. I learn some more information and I say, I'm not so sure I did the right thing. I want to cancel that vote and vote in person on November 3rd. Can we do that in Pennsylvania? You cannot. Um, so in Pennsylvania, um, we because of the secrecy of the ballot required by our constitution, which I very much support, there's not a tracker on your ballot. So there's there's a tracker on the envelope. So I should say, if you... Um, it could be if you did it early enough before it was pre canvas and before the ballot was, um, you know, checked, you know, and removed from the envelope. And this gets into, you know, you, you're probably going to ask about where the legislature may go with uh, pre canvassing allowances if we have any changes. Um, if you, so if you did it early enough, you might be able to cancel your ballot. Um, but in some other states where they have a, a identifying code on the actual ballot. They allow you to go and actually they could pull your, they could find your ballot and pull it and, you know, void it. We don't have that in Pennsylvania. And frankly, I don't think we should. I, I hear the concern about wanting to be able to change your mind, but I honestly think secrecy of the ballot is probably more important. So the bottom line is that once you vote, you voted and you can't really reverse it. Correct. <laughs> and then uh, let me move on finally. Uh, well, not finally, but I wanted to ask you, you referenced funding uh, because there's no question that these election departments, and they do stellar work. And, I, and I'm, I've interviewed all our election directors around uh, this region and uh, to a person, I think they're very uh, good people and they're trying really hard to have fair and secure elections. But we also know that they are short staffed, particularly because of the mail-in ballots. And that often led to them not even counting the ballots until the Wednesday after the uh, election. Um, is there additional funding available to county elections departments to hire more people? Uh, what are your concerns in that area? So, yes, and I'll, you know, of course, uh, you know, last night we saw the news of the first round of, you know, there's more federal dollars being contemplated, um, but the first round of the, um, what's it called, the HEALS Act, I think that was introduced yesterday. That's what the Republicans called their bill. Right. So yeah. they did not include additional elections money, but we did. So, but there is a fair amount of optimism that that's just a starting point and that after negotiations, there'll be more federal dollars that come to elections. So fingers crossed, I've been advocating very, very strongly to the federal government. The National Association for Secretary of State has been advocating um, to really urge that never has it been so critical as right now to make sure that counties have this extra funding to keep us all safe while not impeding our access to democracy. So knock on wood, we'll have even more money. And if we get more money, I intend to give the lion's share of it directly to the counties because that's where the greatest need is. However, if we don't get more money, we did get two federal pots of dollars over the last six months. And we allocated $13 million of that directly to the counties. 
both of these pots of money, it was six million from one pot, seven million from the other, both of them can be used for hiring staff, buying equipment, and other needs related to mail-in voting. So a lot of the counties are doing that um, and are upping their staff, putting out, you know, RFPs for equipment, all kind, you know, third party mailhouse vendors, the dollars can be used for all that. So that's available. And in addition, um, you know, the bond that was authorized under Act 77, the $90 million, though that cannot go towards um, staffing nor mail-in voting, it does go towards equipment. So if they need extra uh, high-speed, high-capacity scanners in order to account for the volume of mail-in voting, that can be covered by that $90 million bond. So we have three different pots of money, and we're just trying to make sure that every county understands that there's a, a wide scope of uses for these funds, and they, this is the time to use them. Let me ask you, Madam Secretary, if I may, about the uh, ability to count these mail-in ballots before Election Day. Under state law, if I understand it correctly, they can't even, they can't really begin to process them, which is to take open, they have to open multiple envelopes. Right. And that's what takes a lot of time. It's not feeding them into scanners, assuming you have a high speed scanner, you can get a quick count. But it's all this opening, which is, I gather, is done by hand or, or at least takes time. And I know you have advocated that elections, uh, the county elections folks be able to start this process earlier. When should they be able to start and where are we? Because I gather this takes an act of the legislature. Yes. Um, so the Act 12 of 2020, which was passed in March, which was the same legislation that changed the date of the primary from April 28th to June 2nd, moved back the, the time for starting the pre-canvassing from 8 p.m. on election day to 7 a.m. on election day. And the primary was a true test of, is that enough time? And I think we all saw the answer in most cases was no, it was not enough time. And so we've been looking at what other states have done because of course, as you know, 30 other states have been voting by some version of no excuse absentee or mail-in voting for, you know, over a decade in most cases. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, states to look at as models. And a lot of them do allow it for weeks at a time beforehand. And even if you allow what we refer to as pre-canvassing steps, as you were talking about, the steps that take, you know, a remarkably long period of time are extracting documents from the actual envelope. So there's envelopers that slice open, there's extractors that pull out the information, you know, then there's another envelope, the secrecy envelope, and another, the ballot inside. So there's a lot of different phases of the process, but ultimately it's of course the humans that need to transition from one thing to the next, and then ultimately, you know, feed it through the scan. So you could do three quarters or four fifths of the process before election day. And even if you don't count the votes, because that's really, I would say if there's any concerns or hesitations, people are afraid that somebody's going to release the result of the election. First of all, there's fines and there's, you know, criminal penalties to do things like that. You could, you know, make sure that those kinds of things are enforced. However, you could also just save that part till election day and do everything else before. So we're advocating for three weeks. That's what we've been asking the legislature to do. Counties can have a county, obviously what you might need to do in Tioga County is different than what you do in Allegheny County. So Allegheny County could have three public meetings in each of the weeks leading up to election day, take care of their 200,000 ballots received before election day. Tioga County may only need one meeting to take care of their ballots. And then we can find ourselves on election day only having to count or canvas the ones that are most recently received. Right. So that would be a great solution. As you mentioned, nonpartisan, bipartisan, There's, it should be non-controversial. We just need to have the legislature hopefully understand that this is a critical need now. And they are not back in session, I don't believe, until when? Mid-September? Or are they going to be back before then? 
I think that's right. I think that's the plan, but they have been adding days and weeks here and there, as you know, from, you know, from random things. And we did just have a Zoom uh, roundtable on elections issues last week. Um, just, you know, every county, as well as the Department of State, strongly advocated for this change. So, you know, if, if, they, if they are, you know, if they share our drive to get this done, there's no question it could get done in time. In your view, uh, Madam Secretary, that change is necessary in order to have a vote result on election night? Correct. I mean, it really comes down to that. Do we want to know how Pennsylvania voted uh, late on November 3rd or very early November 4th? Or do we want to wait weeks and weeks and weeks like they had to do in Philadelphia? And, you know, and I do think, John, that the, the changes that the counties are making to add equipment, add staffing, and learn those lessons from the primary are going to allow things to happen more quickly, even without that legislation. But, you know, when I get asked, will we or will we won't know, will we know um, it within a day or so, the answer really comes down to, is that legislation passed? And there's really no reason for it not to be. Just a couple more questions, Madam Secretary. Uh, thank you again for all your time. This has been very informative. I want to ask, um, before I ask about the security of the elections, I do want to ask you about in-person voting, because I assume we're still going to have a million plus people voting in person, maybe more so than ever. Do you have any sense of how many people might vote in person? You know, I think what we saw from the primary, which was, you know, in the, you know, the the hot, the hardest time of the pandemic, hopefully, hopefully we won't get back to that point in November. And we still had almost 50% of the voters come out in person. So if if I had to guess, and I think uh, I, I, you know, I, I gave a, a prediction one of the other times I was on the show uh, a couple of months ago, and um, I think I ended up being fairly close to what I thought, but more people came out in person than I expected. So if I were to guess now, I would guess that Pennsylvanians who really like to vote in person, about 50% are gonna vote by mail and about 50% are gonna vote in person. So we're preparing all the same, like PPE ordering, uh, making sure that poll workers are adequately supplied, that we have, hand sanitizer and all those same precautions will also be in place for November. You know, the other thing that happened in the primary that uh, was very difficult for people is that that state law did allow the counties to consolidate election or polling places. People are very used to voting in their neighborhoods and right. they do not like the idea of going to one central location in their community to vote. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Secretary, but I believe that was a unique provision of the state law that applied only to the primaries. And so far, at least, counties must continue to have an election in each of their precincts. Now, they can consolidate, I guess, precincts. I don't know what the rule is on that. But the bottom line is that it's going to be easier for people to vote in person in their neighborhoods in the November election than it was last June. Is that right? You're correct. Yes. So that provision was a temporary provision that only applied to June 2nd. So the standard procedure for counties when they want to consolidate polling places, which happens, like it's, it's a very effective election administration tool when you have locations that it makes sense to consolidate and so forth. So it happens. It, there's a lot of that statewide on a regular basis. However, the counties do need to go to their county courts for approval of those consolidations. So rather than just being able to make the decisions on their own or to get Department of State approval, they do need to go into court for that. Um, so it's a routine thing that many counties, if not all counties have done at some point and they still have that option, but the default polling places and precincts go back to where they were before the pandemic. Yeah, it's an important point because you can imagine certain political people wanting to manipulate, make it harder for certain kinds of people to vote by restricting the number of polling areas in one part of a county and making it easier in another part of the county. So 
it really, I mean, it really needs to be uh, carefully watched over. Is that a function of your department as well? Would you speak out on that? We, so we help work with, like if the counties have questions about how to assess their different options, we work with them on all of that. Um, but ultimately, you know, a court would help assess those. So, you know, years and years ago, um, you know, I was involved in a community, there was a polling place being moved from where it had been for years in a particular, you know, um, residential community where it was a, with a large community of color who were largely not with cars. Um, so they were used to being able to walk to their polling place and that county um, had moved that polling place out of that community. So with the court procedure, it allows a community to petition to say, we disagree with what you're doing. Here's why you should consider these other factors. And so it's a, it's a, it's a more fleshed out process, um, which I think again, in, in a normal non-pandemic situation is the right way to go about it. So we're going to have to balance, and it will be with the legislature, of course, where we are as we get closer to election day to see whether, you know, some measures are needed beyond that or whether that process takes care of what we need. Um, final question, Madam Secretary, I want to come back to security issues, because as you know, President Trump has been quite vocal about his fears and concerns about mail-in paper ballots. Uh, and at the same time, we hear concerns from many Democrats about foreign Russian interference in our election process. Uh, are these security concerns legitimate? Uh, what is Pennsylvania doing to make sure that only one ballot per eligible individual and that every ballot gets counted properly? Yeah, great question. And, and, and I want everybody to know that even with all the other challenges that we've had to deal with, election security protections never stopped in Pennsylvania. So we have continued, you know, Pennsylvania has been, has had incredibly strong foundations for election security for years, but even in the two and a half years or so that I've been with the administration, it has con continued to grow enormously. So, um, so they're valid. So to, to your second question first, they're absolutely valid things to think about, prepare for and protect. And I have to say that's exactly what we've been doing in Pennsylvania. And some of those dollars that we got from the federal government is also going into the counties to help strengthen every component piece of our election system from the machine itself to the voter registration system and everything in between. So that's very strong. Plus we have incredibly strong local state and federal partnerships in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so let me ask you about that because I know that if you have paper ballots and no connection to the internet, that actually helps to secure the system. And I, the current, the new systems that we're using are, they're not connected to the internet in any way. Is that right? Correct. And they all have a paper trail, right? So it's completely auditable. And in fact, we're doing a pilot of a statewide audit um, in early to mid August um, to test out, you know, what that, to, to confirm that the outcome of the presidential primary elections were correct. So this is just a pilot to sort of test it, but we've never done this at the statewide level before, and we're doing that in August. So stay tuned for more on that. But the ability to know, like, for example, you've seen um, the news that some years ago, I think many years ago, there was some poll worker that just got prosecuted for you know, plugging some extra votes into a machine. With electronic machines, there was not a separate independent paper trail to compare those notes, right? Now there is. So mm -hmm. you could plug, you, you, well, first of all, you, you need the physical paper in most counties to actually feed through the scanner. And then there also needs to be the verifications, you know, and, and anybody could go and check the paper to the tabulation on the machines. There's that verifiable piece. Um, in addition, just, you know, to talk to your earlier point, um, 
the, in vote by mail, there's a very strenuous, extensive eligibility check in Pennsylvania. Um, and I think I've talked with you about this before, but I think it's really critical for every voter to know that if you vote by mail, in Pennsylvania, first of all, you have to apply. So you submit your application, and the first thing the county does is check your your who you are against if you've put in your driver's license, they check you against the PennDOT database. If you put in your social security number, they're checking you against the social security database. So they're making sure you are who you say you are and that you're in the voter record and eligible to vote before they ever send you a ballot. And then once they get your ballot, they're checking your eligibility again. You've signed the declaration on the outside of the envelope. They're checking to make sure that you're eligible. There's an opportunity for both parties to challenge ballots. Again, front end, back end, you know, many levels of security to make sure every vote, every voter is eligible and every vote is counted securely. Uh, final question, Madam Secretary. What worries you the most about this upcoming November election? I would say what I want most of all is for every voter to make sure there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there in social media. Um, it's so easy to just click retweet of something, not knowing whether it's true or not. And the truth is, you know, this is very sad to say, but most of it is not true what's out there. You know, people just are putting out misinformation and disinformation. So I want every voter to check that they're getting trusted, reliable information. And you can do that by relying on trusted election officials. So go to votespa.com, call our, you know, our toll-free number, 877-VOTES-PA. Um, ask questions of your county election office. Don't trust that just because you see something on social media, it's true. We have strong defenses in place. We have strong eligibility checking. Every voter in Pennsylvania, I wanna make sure feels confident that your vote will be cast and counted securely and accurately. Well, Kathy Bookfar, Pennsylvania's Secretary of State, our top election official, thank you so much for all your time today. We really appreciate it. Lots of good information for people to get. Thank you again. And thank you. Really appreciate your coverage of all these important issues. Just because the weekend starts doesn't mean our commitment to excellence stops. Wake up to KDKA TV News Saturday and Sunday morning for 